It is with great pleasure that I have the opportunity to introduce our speaker for today, Professor Lyndon Archer. He joined Cornell University faculty in 2000. Um, he earned his PhD from in chemical engineering from Stanford University and a BS in chemical engineering from the University of Southern California. He worked as a postdoc for a year at Bell's laboratory, I think with uh, Ron Larson, is that correct? And uh, he was on the faculty at Texas A&M from 94 to 99 in chemical engineering. And then in 2010, after joining Cornell University uh, in 2000, to uh, 2016, he served as the director of the School of Biomolecular Engineering, Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at Cornell. And in the fall in 2017, he was appointed director of Cornell's Energy Systems Institute. Professor Archer is a fellow of the American Physical Society and a member of the National Academy of Engineering. His research contributions have been recognized within a variety of awards, including the National Science Foundation uh, Award for Special Creativity, the American Institute for Chemical Engineers Centennial Engineer, and Nanoscience and Engineering Forum Awards. He's also received the Thomson Reuters uh, World's Most Influential Scientific Minds, and also uh, this was in material science. And not only is he a great researcher, he's also an awesome teacher. He has won the James and Mary Tien's Award for Excellence in Teaching, and thrice uh, he's achieved the Merrill's Presidential Fellows as the most influential member of the Cornell University faculty. His research interests include uh, focus, I mean, his research interests focuses on structure dynamics and transport phenomena in liquid solid interfaces. Can all of the students who love transport phenomena give a clap? All right, so I expect him to receive a standing ovation at the end of his presentation. <laughs> Professor Archer is currently the James A. Friend Family Distinguished Professor in Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. And um, I think I better stop there so that he will have plenty of time to give his presentation. But let's give him a hand. All right, so um, I assume someone is gonna switch to the talk. So thanks, Michael, for a very nice um, introduction and Arvind for um, the invitation. This is actually my third time visiting Purdue in, in two decades, and you've done well by spacing them out. So at least I have a chance <laughs> to pretend that some of you forgot what I, said, um, what I said last time. But this is quite an honor. And I think that the, um, it, it is true to say that there's a sort of incremental aspect to um, academic research. It begins with an idea to solve, um, in this um, talk, a, a big problem, a hard problem, having to do with energy storage. But, and it does it in a field that is actually dominated by chemists and material scientists. And so when I entered this field about a decade ago, the um, question was, what can a chemical engineer do? And what value can a chemical engineer add? And it turns out uh, Michael is quite prescient, or has a good memory, that transport phenomena is really very interesting, um, gives you very interesting opportunities. So that's the sort of subplot of the talk um, I'm gonna give you today. So we are gonna start big to give you a sense of you know, why the questions I'm asking are, are potentially important, and then we're gonna go small to talk about you know, what are some of the solutions one can do to these problems from the perspective of molecules and material design. So like I said, I wanna start by giving you a perspective on the, on the big picture. 
And I was actually quite impressed with this list of 21st century grand challenges that the National Academy of Engineering um, came up with in the year uh, 2008. And what um, caught my attention was the first two of these grand challenges. That the claim was that by, you know, for the next century, you, me, us engineers, should make a contribution that solves these 10 questions, and in particular, these first two questions, affordable solar energy and energy from fusion. And I think any of you who've spent any time thinking about you know, how the sun produces energy, how solar energy is created, understand that actually it is from fusion. So what this list is telling us, you either learn how to use energy from our existing sun or learn how to make your own sun that is portable. So it's really about the sun, okay? Now what does that have to do with the topic of the talk, which is energy storage? Well, one of the real miracles, I would say, of the last um, half a decade or so has been the speed with which energy cost produced from solar has been dropping. Such that now, levelized costs are about five cents per kilowatt hour for solar energy contracts, which means that solar energy can compete pound for pound with energy generated from fossil fuel uh, combustion, which is remarkable considering that just five years ago, the thought was that the NAE you know, goals were unrealistic even for a century. All right, so, um, so the question obviously then is why don't we have solar energy um, everywhere? Why don't we have solar farms everywhere? Why aren't we decarbonizing by essentially building our own suns or using the existing sun um, to generate energy? The answer is in the bottom bullet that the essence of solar energy is that it's, not, it's actually intermittent, meaning the sun isn't always shining. The end result obviously is that you either have to go where the sun is, basically you know, rotate, the panel with the rotation of the earth, which will definitely push the price back up. Or you discover a way to store energy when it's in abundance to reuse it. And this is where batteries um, that I want to talk about come in. Now their costs have actually been also declining, but not fast enough. So from roughly about $800 a kilowatt hour in 2013 to order $200 a kilowatt hour um, just last year. So batteries have been coming down quite rapidly in cost, uh, largely because of the um, innovations and so forth people have been implementing in manufacturing of lithium ion uh, technology. Now, obviously batteries are needed beyond just balancing renewables and that provides an additional driving force uh, for innovation. So they're needing for leveling uh, wind energy, which is also like solar um, intermittent. They're needed by you, right? So you guys want smaller, more powerful machines. That is unfortunately still limited by the power and energy density of our batteries. And of course, with every passing year, there's a, not a new application that needs better batteries, right? So it started off with these drones, then the cool cars, and now everywhere you look, it seems like these autonomous robots are dominating and they need a supply of energy that is portable. So, um, so I was inspired by this chart that I didn't make, but I wish I had made. That's why I started adding to it, and you see my name now associated with this chart. But it was a chart made by my colleague Yetming Chang at MIT. And so Yet basically did a techno-economic assessment that looked at what it would take in terms of energy cost for batteries, or the cost of batteries per unit of energy stored produce amortized costs, right? So remember, a rechargeable battery doesn't just work one time. It works over some number of years, right? And the thought is that if the rechargeable battery operates trouble-free for order three years, what would the cost need to be so that we can get to the two to three cents a kilowatt hour amortized cost? And he came up with this chart. So the red line is, says that, well, if we want to get there, the materials costs have to be at least $100 a kilowatt hour or lower. 
And so what Yet did is organize pretty much all of the couples, anode, cathode chemistries that he could put his hands on, and did this kind of assessment of materials cost. Now it is understood that the cost of the materials in the battery is not everything. That is just part of the cost. But the analysis that's going on in the background is that if you can keep this cost below $100 per kilowatt hour, you can maintain the overall amortized cost below this two to three cents a kilowatt hour that would be needed to, to be unbalanced with solar. So the interesting result, if you look at this chart, you will see that lithium ion technologies are largely bunched up near the $100 a kilowatt hour number on materials cost, which is a good thing, which is in fact why it is that solar is today important with lithium ion technology. But if you actually come down this chart to chemistries that will cost a dollar a kilowatt hour, $10 per kilowatt hour, you see there are lots of chemistries, but if you look carefully, you will notice that all of them use a metal as the battery anode. Sodium, zinc, lithium, alumina. The more earth abundant the metal becomes and the more multivalent it is, it means the energy density and the cost are both, the energy density is going up, the cost is going down, and so the energy density per unit cost goes down very rapidly. Now the question then is why is it that we don't have batteries that use metals, sodium, zinc, and so forth in current circulation if these batteries have the propensity just on the basis of the energy density of the metal anode and on the basis of the earth abundance to produce the cost and performance criteria we need, why don't we have these batteries um, available today? And the answer is actually pretty simple and is the genesis of the idea that I had maybe about 10 years ago that I'm gonna to describe to you um, today. So the first battery, or the first lithium, ad, lithium battery was in fact of the design that yet discovered would be cost effective. It was a so-called lithium metal battery discovered when this man who actually won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry just last year, um, Stan Whittingham, was employed by ExxonMobil of all places, okay? And what Stan discovered is that a battery in which we stored charge by essentially plating metallic lithium in the anode, discharged the battery to store the lithium as lithium ions in a cathode that could be an intercalating material, could produce lots of energy at a relatively low cost. These batteries were great in the laboratory, but when they were brought into practice, something very strange occurred, and I wanna start this uh, lecture by showing you that animation of what that strange effect is. So again, at first, lithium is in the anode. When the battery discharges, the lithium oxidizes, becomes Li plus. Under the action of the electric field, the Li plus moves from the anode to the cathode where it's hosted. When you discharge the battery, you want exactly the same thing to happen. And if you're gonna get three years trouble-free lifetime, you want this to happen repeatedly over many cycles of charge and discharge. And so the animation is gonna show you why we don't have batteries of this type um, today. So at first everything is going great, okay? Charge, discharge, but then these structures known as dendrites begin to grow on the metal anode. They very easily pierce this polymer separator, cross over to the cathode, shorts the battery internally. The ohmic heat generated as a consequence of that short is typically enough to ignite a liquid electrolyte in the space between the cell. So these things are a safety hazard and no one will ins insure you if you put them in, say, an electric vehicle. Now what caught my attention was that this is a physical problem. So at least that's what I thought at the beginning. This is a physical problem. Can we stop it using an understanding of physics? Can we stop the material from growing in this non-planar fashion to do something more planar? by understanding fundamentally what causes it to form this instability and what are the factors that control the rate at which this instability develops and, and propagate. So, um, so, so I, I'm a planner, so I wanted to understand what the literature understood about the source of this instability. And the more I learned, the more complicated it seems. And so I'm gonna try to tell you what I learned. So I learned that there are basically two effects. One at low current that's driven primarily by chemistry and one at high current that is driven by fluid mechanics. In other words, you can't escape 
whether you're at low or high current, this instability happens. At low current, it is thought that what occurs is that first the metal, be it lithium, sodium, aluminum, reacts with the electrolyte that's present in its vicinity to form what's called a solid electrolyte interface. So this is a new material that results from the chemical conversion of the electrolyte in contact with the metal. The trouble is that for reactive metals, they're quite eager to participate in these reactions. And so the end result is that they react everywhere they touch the electrolyte. And the consequence is that you have this sort of patchy SEI, a heterogeneous interface. Remember, no one knows this, right? So don't get carried away. People just believe this is what occurs. And these heterogeneous interfaces, as you can see from the differences in color, are clearly different. They might have different thicknesses. They might have different transport properties. And so the thought is that the next step in this process is that the places along the surface that have faster lithium transport are better hosts for lithium. The end result is that when lithium deposits during the first cycle, it deposits in these bumps. And these bumps are called dendrite nucleates. Now, many of you have heard of the lightning rod effect, right? The lightning rod effect basically goes something like this, right? Your odds of being struck by lightning if you go into a thunderstorm is like one in a million. But if you go outside with a pointy metal pole, your odds are one, okay, <laughs> that, that you will be struck. And the reason for that is that the pointy metal pole concentrates electric field lines at a point, and this then makes it an attractor for the lightning strikes. Exactly the same thing occurs inside the battery, where these bumps become essentially like lightning rods. The electric field lines concentrate on the rods, accelerates the lithium deposition on the bumps, and off to the races, and the dendrites are formed. All right, so the first step is chemistry, the second step is deposition, and the third step is electrodynamics, or electrohydrodynamics, the deposition of the metal on the bumps. So you've got to understand all of that in principle to solve this problem. The second um, um, pathway is actually somewhat more interesting and one that I will start with um, in, in terms of proposing solutions. That basically any electrolyte that contains um, cations and anions driven at a current above a certain special value called the diffusion limit, which is sort of like the speed limit at which ions can move in a liquid electrolyte, develops a hydrodynamic instability that looks like turbulence the fluid mechanical turbulence. And that instability in a closed cell has a certain pattern. And the pattern is actually illustrated here in this very nice work by Huth since the 1990s. It has this very nice roll cell structure where it has the configuration that it dumps material to certain specialized spots at the interface between the electrolyte and the electrode with the end result that you produce, not by chemistry, but by hydrodynamics, a configuration that's very similar to the one produced by chemistry, bumps that are distributed on the surface. And just as in this case, once those bumps are formed, they concentrate field lines, and off to the races, the dendrites grow. So what in the world can one do? So we spent a lot of time now classifying the types of instabilities that could occur as a consequence of the two pathways I just described. And we know that there are essentially four there's a hydrodynamic, which is the last thing I told you about, this sort of idea that fluid mechanics produces turbulent-like effects at the interface between the electrolyte and the electrode. And then there's a first phenomena, the chemical, that produces the bumps that act as lightning rods that ends up causing so-called morphological instability. Now, there are others. There's a mechanical instability that I had some really nice discussions this morning with some people interested in mechanics of how dendrites form and break. And there's also a kind of chemical corrosion type instability that is, that is quite important. But in the interest of keeping this talk under five hours, I will, um, I will just focus on the two. And the intention is not to tell you everything, but to give you a perspective on you know, how we think, what we do, and what the results are, all right? So let's begin here. And we're gonna begin with a bit of an introduction to, um, to um, electrokinetics, which is transport inside a battery, okay? So the equations of electrokinetics are written here, and they look kind of foreboding. But they're simple equations, so the first one is the conservation of mass. 
The second one is the conservation of momentum. This one here is the conservation of mass in an incompressible fluid, right? Grad dot u equals to zero. Uf means the velocity of the fluid. F means fluid. And this one here is the so-called Planck equation or uh, Coulomb's equation that basically tells you that all of this is happening inside an electrochemical system. It's driven by an electric field. Now, in principle, these equations are a set of very complicated coupled differential equations that, in, that could also be time dependent that you have to solve to determine the concentration of ions and how ions move, the velocity um, um, in the electrochemical cell. Now, people are lazy and with some justification in general, and they say, well, it's a battery, it's a closed cell, so we don't expect any fluid flow to occur, so we set UF to be zero. We say, oh, well, we are gonna wait long enough and we're gonna consider this problem to reach steady state, and so we set the time dependent terms uh, to be zero, and we say, well, you know, in principle, electron neutrality is typically, you know, right in liquids, so we're gonna basically set the right-hand side of the Poisson equation to also be zero. Now when you do that, you get a very nice and interesting solution to this problem that's illustrated in the right, where I plot basically the flux of ions, or a current, J, as a function, in this case, of the potential, V, that I apply, in other words, the driving force. What we find is that the current at low potentials is actually proportional to the potential. This is a so-called Ohm's law-like response, right? V is equal to IR, so the current just responds in proportion to the potential. But when you get above a current, a, this is, a, this is a, um, a, a dimensionless potential of order four, you notice the current saturates a certain value such that this ratio, J over JL is one. And that value is called the diffusion limit. This is where J becomes JL, the so-called limiting current. So it's telling you that in an electrochemical cell, there's a maximum current that you can operate at. Once you get to that maximum current, it doesn't matter how hard you drive the system, you can't get any more current out of this system. That's what these equations tell us. Reality is very different. In fact, what people typically find is that if you measure the current versus voltage in an actual electrochemical cell, you, you in fact get the Ohm's law regime as predicted at low potentials, the linear regime. You in fact get this transition to the limiting current regime but if you keep driving the system, what they observe is that you get an additional regime where the current starts to increase with voltage, and this is referred to as over-limiting conductance. Now, when this was first discovered, it was highly controversial. It was controversial because most of the discoveries were made in electrolytes that use water. And so the thought was that this extra current was actually coming from the electrolysis of water, that you were basically breaking down the water and producing electrical energy as a consequence. In 2013, a group at Stanford decided, well, why don't we simulate this? We have very powerful numerical simulations where we don't have to make any of the assumptions I made earlier to solve the Nernst-Planck equations. Let's just solve this thing with a very powerful computer. And what they discovered, this is the, the group of Alimani, um, is something very beautiful. So what they discovered that at first, everything is fine, the ions in the electrolyte are homogeneously distributed, uh, more or less, in the bulk, except for a very small layer, the so-called quiescent electric double layer, or the Debye-Huckel double layer, as some of you may know it, that's affiliated to the surface that has a slight increase in positive charges because the surface is slightly negative in charge. When you drive the system at potentials above the limiting current, the prediction is that suddenly you start to create these rolls these turbulent rolls. If you drive it even faster, what they discovered is that these rolls become chaotic and time dependent. And in fact, when you look at the chaos and the time dependence, it looks very much like normal fluid mechanics, so-called inertial turbulence. But except this kind of turbulence is coming from the right-hand side of the momentum balance equation, right? It's coming from the coupling between the electric field and the charge distribution whereas the normal turbulence comes from the left-hand side, which is from the nonlinear term, the V grad V term in the momentum balance equation. So this is an eye-opener that says that even in a system that is at um, um, flow fields well below what you would consider um, laminar, it can become turbulent. 
in an electrochemical setting. I know the hydrodynamics folks are having fun and the rest of you are saying, what is he talking about, all right? So let's move on. I have to say that because that is, that is fun, okay? So, so we decided, right, simulations are simulations, theories are theories. Is this really true? Okay, so we decided to do an experiment, very simple experiment, where we took an electrolyte, we put tracer particles in this electrolyte, they're dyed blue, this is why everything looks blue on the right, and we developed a microscopy cell where we can just watch and see what happens to those tracer particles, and we can then gradually ramp up the electric field to see if the simulations are right. And so the next click should give you a video of what we see, and there's nothing special here. And so if you look near the wall, you will see that um, all hell breaks loose in the fluid. And in fact, if you look at the structure of these rolls, you'll see that they're not dissimilar to what the theory says, indicating that indeed, this hydrodynamic instability predicted by simulations, this roll cell instability can produce convection and can produce highly localized convection, which can lead to the instability in, in the high current case that I mentioned earlier. So that was good. Now we can do more. We can actually map out the velocity profile in the fluid near the wall. And what we discovered is that if we now map out the velocity field based on the particles, the velocity has two dominant components. It has a component U that is parallel to the surface and a component V that's actually perpendicular to the surface. So stuff comes in and goes out, kind of like that, okay? And so this is U, this is V. No, sorry, I lied. V, U, okay? Now what is even more interesting is that if you now monitor U as a function of distance from the wall, so the wall is here, right? Roughly at about um, 1200 or 1180 uh, microns. It initially rises with distance, meaning this fluid is moving faster as you're going away from the wall, but then it starts to fall. And this point is what's called a boundary layer. So there's a transition in the physics that are occurring as you go from the wall outwards, such that if you were far away from the wall, you might think that the fluid is actually slipping at this plane. Okay, so this is a kind of interesting result. So it's slipping near the plane, and in the region near the wall, the fluid is experiencing a very strong shear flow, right? Very strong shear because the velocity is changing very quickly with distance. What can a chemical engineer do, all right? Well, so, um, so I convinced a whole bunch of students that polymers are the answer, okay? And, um, and they've all gone on to do great things, so it tells you they are partly the answer, okay? So, so the reason I thought polymers were the answer is that polymers allow us to do two very interesting things, right? So the first is illustrated in this cartoon. We can create polymers in configurations that selectively stop the fluid from moving, meaning they provide a net that stops the fluid from moving, high viscosity net that stops the fluid from moving. But if the spacing between the net is large enough, the ions in the fluid can move as if the polymer is not there. Now why is that important? We're trying to make a battery. <laughs> and at the end of the day, if we stop the instability and also stop the ions, we've gotten nowhere, okay? So polymers that are entangled with big entanglement spacings, this is our kind of instinct, would be a good idea because it can stop the hydrodynamic flow that produces the eddies without compromising the ability of ions to get to the interface, which is what a battery needs to do. And so I'm a, not a betting person, so I decided that one hypothesis isn't enough. You need two, okay, just so that you have a trap door in case the one does not work. And so the second hypothesis is actually more interesting, and it comes from the structure of the velocity profile of the particles we measured by experiment. So the structure of the velocity profile told us that the fluid came down towards the surface and then moved outwards, came down, and outwards. And remember, earlier I said to you that the places where it came down were the places where the bump, bumps formed. This is where the lightning rods form, and that is called a stagnation point. And so the thought is that if I can somehow have big enough polymers localized near the interface, at that stagnation point, they will be stretched out. And when they're stretched out, they should exert very large stresses on the fluid that essentially prevents stuff from accumulating at those stagnation points. So 
Those are two theories. Now it turns out we can test them, and I'll tell you how we did. So again, more equations, I'm sorry, but I had to do this, all right? So, um, so these are the same equations you saw before. These are the same Nernst-Planck equations, except now what we want to do is model them in the presence of a polymer. And when you write down equations for fluid with a polymer, you need what's called a constitutive law, which essentially tells you how the velocity relates to the stresses, all right? Nothing fancy, so don't read every word, okay? And we decided to use this very special constitutive law called the Roly-Poly model, right? So it sounds cool, right? The Roly-Poly model is probably the best constitutive model for entangled polymers that is out there. And so we knew that if the Roly-Poly model couldn't predict what we were observing, nothing could, because this is quite the best model, all right? So that's what we did. And then we did what's called linear stability analysis. And so the idea is that we perturb the surface. We say, what if bumps form? What if bumps form? Well, obviously, if bumps form, they change the boundary conditions, the fluid experiences, and that then propagates through all the equations, all the variables. And the question was, if we then enforce the boundary conditions that the fluid, the ions cannot, the, the negative ions cannot penetrate through the interface, and the positive ions deposit at the interface to produce a current, we can then figure out what the growth rate is of these bumps. That is a mouthful. The answer is nicer, cleaner. So what we can do is actually plot that growth rate for a fixed polymer concentration, 0.01, so that's 1%, at a fixed potential, so this potential is 10 times the critical potential where the current approaches the limiting value. So we are well into this zone of bad stuff, all right? And the question we were asking is, is the growth rate negative or positive or zero? Obviously, if it's positive, it means the bump once formed will grow, and the thing is unstable, we will get dendrites. If it's negative or zero, it means the bumps once formed will not grow, and that is a good thing. And so what we decided to do is for a fixed polymer concentration to vary the molecular weight of the polymer and monitor the growth rate for different sizes of the initial bumps. And this is called the wave number, okay? And even you can see what occurs, right? So when there's no polymer, zero, the growth rate initially is close to zero and then it diverges, meaning the system is unstable. As we increase to 100, same thing happens. But when we get to about 500 or 2,000, the thing is completely stable. So it's telling us that my hypothesis at least has support from theory. The theory tells me that my hypothesis that the polymer should be able to selectively stop the um, perturbations from growing, the bumps from forming, is, is reasonable, all right? So next, I did it. Okay, and this is a bit abbreviated, so I did it. I just put the polymers in, and I chose polymers that had relatively high molecular weights. So these are eight million PEO, and polymers that had relatively low concentrations to make big pores like I wanted. Uh, so 0.5 weight percent, one weight percent. And I used that device that I showed you earlier to basically monitor how the velocity of fluid was going on uh, near the wall. And what you can see is that I change the concentration of polymer, the shape of this structure doesn't change a lot, but the values change a lot, right? So for example, if we look at the peak value in U, we see that it goes down by something of order, a factor of four to five, okay? In the presence of 0.5 weight percent polymer. And when I go from 0.5 weight percent to one weight percent, it goes down by another factor of five to eight, all right? Indicating that I'm suppressing this flow like crazy in the presence of this polymer. What we also notice is that the distance at which the peak appears, right, so this is where the so-called boundary layer that I mentioned before appears, begins to shrink. So as we add polymer to the system, the boundary layer begins to shrink, meaning that any flow is being confined to a progressively tighter and tighter layer near the interface where it's less harmful. All right, so the experiments, the visualization experiments tell us, oh, the polymer is appearing to suppress the electric convective flow. But remember what started me along this line of attack was this experimental observation that says that in real systems, when I push the system above the diffusion limit, I get new flow, I get new current. And the question was, if this is true, that the polymer is able to slow down 
convection, which is the source of the new current, then it should be able to slow down the new current itself. And so we measure that. And that, this turns out to be a much easier measurement to make. So we basically measure the current, J versus V, in electrolytes that first had no polymer, were initially linear, and then they diverge. In this case, they don't even get to the limiting current. The flow is so strong, the convection is so strong. But as we add polymer, you see this kind of bending over of the curve. So you shift it, you shift this region of upturn, this flow region, out to much um, um, higher voltages, indicating that you're able to stabilize the flow at any given voltage. So that was kind of nice. Where I started, though, was uh, can I stop the instability which produces the dendrites from occurring? I'll skip that. Um, and the answer is, um, my goodness, yes, okay? So, so the, the student who did this was actually a very interesting student. She wasn't interested to just do it for lithium, where what we're doing, again, is plotting how the trace of particles move, which I showed you earlier, but also looking at how the interface grows. In the top, this is the absence of polymer. In the bottom is when we add the polymer. So in the top, what you notice is that, first of all, the bumps grow in a random way, so they begin to become dendritic, and as I deposit more, the bumps grow even more. If I look at the trace of particle lines, I can see that, in fact, the theory is right, that the trace of particles appear to point towards the bump, indicating that the fluid flows are, in fact, feeding the growth of the bump, as we speculated at the beginning. In the case of electrolytes with polymers, you notice something very different. The growth is not completely flat, but more uniform than in the case without polymers. And what we also notice if we monitor the trace of particles, there's this gentle rain. They just come down uniformly across the surface, indicating that the polymer is able to provide uniformity in the deposition. Now, I said the student was special, that she was really surprised by this result, even though we predicted it. And so she decided to do it for sodium, aluminum, copper, pretty much anything she could get her hand on. And as reported in this paper, it works in every case, indicating that this phenomena is really not about chemistry of the metal. It's more fundamental and it's more physical, and it is um, um, a, an indication that by stopping the hydrodynamic instability, we can stop this um, so-called um, morphological um, um, growth that produces dendritic deposition. So that was fun. Now, um, I guess more math. So we wanted to know how the polymer worked, right? So I kind of showed you that it worked. I kind of show you that it's working had consequences for the limiting current. I kind of show you that that had consequences for the deposition. But we wanted to know in detail what is it the polymer did, OK? And so we decided to do more simulations, right? Again, it's the same equations, just that they're written in a nicer way again. But instead of using that roly-poly polymer model, we use a polymer model called the Fini CR model that is actually more amenable to very straightforward numerical simulations. And what is nice here is that we can now simulate the whole system, including the polymer stresses, to basically see what's going on, when it's happening, so we can learn what the mechanism is by which the polymer is producing stability. And so perhaps we can understand why it's so effective across different types of chemistries, all right? So, um, so the results are kind of cool. So the left is essentially a video showing you what occurs. This number, Debra number, is actually a surrogate for the polymer effect. So a big Debra number means a big polymer effect. It's kind of like a large polymer concentration. And if you stare at this thing, you will notice that as the fluid lines come down, the polymers, this thing becomes red, so the polymers are highly stretched, just like I predicted earlier. But then what is occurring is that even before the fluid stops coming down, the polymer relaxes and then moves again, with the end result that the polymer causes a kind of chaotic flow in its own self near the interface, producing, and it's, it's more apparent in the case of high polymer concentration, producing a kind of backflow that homogenizes the downflow of ions towards the interface and in so doing, we believe, homogenizes the deposition of the metal at the interface. So it's not that the polymer is stopping anything. The polymer is actually making it more chaotic by providing elastic stresses that are time dependent 
that are driving this sort of chaotic motion of the fluid in the vicinity of the surface, and that chaotic motion is causing the current, if we measure it as a function of position, to become generally flatter in the case of a polymer, where the Debra number is non-zero, to more bumpy in the case of a polymer, where there are hot spots. In the case of no polymer, where the Debra number is zero. All right, so, um, so, the, so the lessons from this part of the talk are actually pretty simple, but pretty important. The first lesson is indicated here that over-limiting conductance, this upturn in the IV curve, is in fact produced by convection. And what is important is that we can extend the diffusion-limited regime by using polymers that provide viscoelasticity into liquid electrolyte. And perhaps more important is that if we arrest that um, um, convective instability, we can um, arrest the um, dendritic deposition of the metal um, with the idea that we um, introduce unsteadiness in the flow that makes it more uniform um, in deposition. So that is, um, that is part A. Part B is a little shorter, but just as exciting, all right? So this is the high current case. The low current case, is hard, okay, because it starts with chemistry. And the question that I struggled with was like, how do you make lithium not behave like itself, which is want to react with everything? How do you make chemistry of lithium look like the chemistry of copper, for example? And I know how to do that now, but at the time we did this work, I didn't. And so I did what chemical engineers do, I cheated, right? So I said, well, I can't do this with you know, enough confidence. So I'm gonna pretend the lightning rods are formed. And I'm gonna ask, can physics win over chemistry? That's what I'm gonna ask. In other words, I'm gonna do, um, yeah, this is fun, but I'm gonna come back, please, maybe in the questions. Okay, so, so I asked this question, right? So the question I asked is, um, just as in the last part of the talk, what if bumps are formed? Can I learn something from the Nernst Planck, the stability of the Nernst Planck equations now at low currents, not at high currents, which is the case I did first, at low currents, that gives me hope. That gives me hope, okay? So, so we did the same thing as before. So we write down again the conservation of mass equations, and this is the flux. The flux has basically three terms, so there's a diffusion term. There's an electromigration term that goes like the potential difference. And there's a so-called pressure diffusion term, which was not known before this work. And the way this pressure diffusion term works is actually pretty simple. So it works as follows. So imagine that this is the battery and this thing is the separator, right? So remember the plastic thing that is between the electrodes. So our thinking was that when a bump forms, it slightly compresses the separator because there's no place for it to go. When it compresses the separator, what it does is basically reduces the volume that is available for fluid, so it increases the pressure slightly on the fluid. And so our thinking was that region where the pressure is slightly higher, it means the chemical potential of the fluid is slightly higher, so the fluid has a tendency to want to move away from that part to go elsewhere on the electrode. So this so-called pressure migration term actually acts against the bump. So if the bump grows, the localized pressure is higher, so you push things out more, so it kind of stops itself from growing. So that was just a thought. Now, just as again with that complicated roly-poly model, we can pretend that this thing follows linear stability theory, we can perturb all the equations, and we can solve uh, for the growth rate. What we discovered is something remarkable for the field that no one, as far as we know at the time, um, expected. So we came up with what's called a stability map, which are, again, are regions where sigma, the growth rate, are positive, negative, or zero. The way you should understand this map is that the regions that are in white, sigma is negative, meaning that you will get stable deposition if you can operate even a system that you have no control of its chemistry um, in. The regions in gray are regions where the lightning rod just takes off and the odds are one that it becomes unstable. Now what was surprising to us is that by plotting the length scale of the bumps, 
against the modulus of the separator, which again enters through this pressure term, we found that you can get stability at any pressure, at any modulus. And the field used to think that this is only possible for solid state electrolytes, where the modulus of the electrolytes is bigger than the modulus of the metal. In other words, if the modulus of your separator or electrolyte is larger than the modulus of the metal, it means the bumps just can't go, grow through it. What we're saying here, not true. We're saying that if you design the system right, in such a way that lambda, the length scale of the bumps, are smaller than a certain critical value, any modulus should be able to stop the dendrites from growing. Controversial, the stuff that you should be thrown out of a room like this um, for saying. But we said it, and then we did it, right? So the question was, how in the world can you do this? Well, you can predict what that length scale needs to be by looking at what the normal parameters are in a typical electrolyte. And it turns out for a typical one molar LIPF6 ECDMC popular electrolyte, that number is 250 nanometers. So it says if you can keep those spacings, if you can keep those bumps below 250 nanometers, you can stop dendrites from growing in any electrolyte. And so the way we did it is to create what are called nanoporous um, electrolytes in two different configurations, right? So one are electrolytes created by cross-linking nanoparticles. So these things are like porous media, where you control the pore size, that 250 nanometer number, by basically the length of the ligands that connects the particles. So that's relatively easy to do chemistry from chemistry. So the end result is that you make plastic-like sheets, where these sheets have a secret that they're porous. And this is what the secret looks like. So the black spots are the particles, so ions can't move through them. The gray spots are the empty spaces that ions can move through. And again, by controlling the number density of the black spots, I can control the gray space size. So I can control this length scale lambda, okay? The other system is cleaner and actually more amenable to fundamental studies. So what we decided to do is to create using uh, 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 anodized alumina, which makes very beautiful porous structures, where you can control the size of the pores by the voltage at which you create the porous structures to create things that have pore sizes that range, I will show you in a minute, all the way from a few tens of nanometers to hundreds of nanometers. And these are straight pores, so we can test the, um, the predictions uh, somewhat more rigorously. So to cut a long story short, we use two different methods to evaluate efficacy. So one method is called the galvanostatic plate strip experiment. So we apply a constant current and take lithium, or any metal for that matter, from one object, in this case a foil, oxidize it to the ions and deposit on the second element, again a metal foil. And we do it at constant current, so we take lithium from one place, strip it, plate it on the next one. Once we do that for a certain period of time, we reverse it, and we basically measure the voltage. If the system was behaving in a simple Ohm's law-like way, we would get a response like this, okay? An oscillatory response where the amplitude of the current remains more or less the same, okay? What we observe in general is that this kind of Ohm's law-like response sustains for some number of cycles, in this example for about 55 plate strip cycles, but then it reaches a point where something gives. And we have a sudden drop in the voltage, meaning that there's a lower resistance pathway somewhere, and this is a dendrite, this is a short, indicating that you can quantify very easily the effectiveness of this membrane, either based on the amount of charge passed, CD, at the time the dendrites are formed, or by the number of cycles at which they're formed. Now, we like this number better because CD would be infinite in the case of something that stops the dendrites entirely, such that its reciprocal would be zero. So this gives us a really simple figure of merit to know whether this theory is right and whether the materials we've developed are, are effective. And so, um, so, so here are the results, right? And so you look at them for yourselves, all right? So the red is the electrolyte without the nanostructured membrane. And so what you see is that after you know, roughly about 50 hours, it's random, right? It, it goes to zero, then it cranks up back, and then it goes to zero again, indicating we've shorted. This is what happens with a 20 nanometer porous structure. It goes on for hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of hours, and then the challenge becomes how does a student graduate, all right, if you just keep going, 
okay? So, so I, want, <laughs> I wanted to make this thing fail, okay? Because uh, we had to know when it fails. So we increased the current. We increased the current to values that are not even normal, at least at that time, in lithium cells. And you can see it just goes on and on, indicating that we've completely eliminated the propagation and proliferation of the dendritic bumps in these systems. So the question was, OK, 20 nanometers is a lot bigger than 250. What happens as you begin to approach the limit specified by theory? So we started to look at bigger and bigger AAO structures, so 20, 50, 100, 200, 300. And each of them, we're looking at the highest current density. And I think what you will notice here is that somewhere between 200 and 300, things went awry, which is just remarkably consistent with the theory. In fact, I don't believe this to be true, just, just so you know, all right? But it, but, but it is true, at least in this instance, that it's almost right on the money telling us that the cutoff length scale is consistent with what we predicted um, theoretically. Uh, so there are lots of other things we did, but I'm not gonna bore you because I noticed that in trying to set the slides up, I overstayed my welcome. Um, so, I'm, so I'm just gonna end with this kind of summary slide that um, essentially says um, my group kind of went wild after this occurred. And some of you who know my polymers work keep asking me, when are you gonna do more polymers work? And the reason I can't is that students have been just excited by this result, that they've been trying pretty much everything they can get their hands on, uh, from cross-linked polymers to this structure that I showed you to that structure. Very recently, we have this very nice paper that showed up in Science that looks at um, heteroepitaxial control of the deposition. And the, the framework is beautiful in that it really gives us a way of, um, once we understand the stability of the interface, it turns out that with the structure of the electrolyte, we can control the stability of deposition. So that's kind of what I told you in the second section. The main result is that we're kind of excited that in a variety of configurations, we can di design electrolytes that appear to overcome this problem of battery failure or metal battery failure by dendrite formation and proliferation. It's not over, right? There are other things to work out, and I'm happy to answer questions about some of those other things. Um, but I want to just spend a moment just saying thanks to the students who did all the great work. Um, so these are all just fabulous students. One of the things we have at Cornell are just exceptional students, like your Professor Chung Lee Yuan, who many of you, many of you know, who um, just go beyond beyond in terms of um, how they execute work and the elegance with which they do things. And I do a lot of collaborative work with um, Don Koch, who's a really nice uh, person to work with and a theorist, and Jeff Coates, who's probably one of the best polymer chemists um, I know. And the, the, a lot of our work was actually funded not by the DOE, as you might imagine, but by the NSF, who kind of saw this as a way of understanding how polymer structure might influence um, energy systems um, of the future. All right, so. I'd, Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions you've got. Okay, we have time for uh, a half a question. Uh. <laughs> Can we start with a fourth of a question from students? Oh. We will start with questions from students. One transport question, yes. In the case of the turbulent, the of the turbulent flow beyond the current regime, does the counterflow originate from the movement of the counter ion? And if so, does the transference number have an effect on the turbulence? Um, that's a great question, yeah. So the, um, so it's, uh, so the answer is um, the flow actually results from the coupling between the concentration of the um, active ion and the electric potential. The counter ion enters because electroneutrality would want those, the concentration of the counter ion to be everywhere equal to that of the active ion, which in this case is a metal ion. Once you get a separation between those two, as required to create a gradient in the concentration of the active ion, 
you have an electric field penalty for that separation. And so it sort of it feeds on itself. So that gradient creates a high electric field and is a product of that gradient and the electric field that drives the instability. All right, so, it's, um, so if you had a single ion conductor, which is I think what you're alluding to, something that literally prevents the gradient from occurring, in theory we would expect to not have this instability at all. And we have some work that shows that as you approach so-called transference numbers of one, where you're not allowed to separate the ions because you're tethered together, you do in fact have a suppressing effect that's bigger than what you see in the case of a neutral polymer. Okay, we have time for one more question. Uh, thank you. I was wondering about the first part of your uh, presentation regarding your uh, roly-poly model, hmm. modeling of the polymers. So I was wondering, um, were you testing like polymers? Like for example, I noticed you, you had done something with PEO. So I was wondering if you had done some testing or knew if there was a difference between uh, testing with the linear PEO polymer versus a, like a graft PEO polymer, like PEGMA or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's something that's in our future. And um, it's my way back to polymer science, right? Um, and it's, it's an important question because um, there's a pretty large literature that tells us that the um, way a polymer stress is developed in response to shear depends a lot on its architecture. In particular, polymers that are branched tend to stretch more and offer much larger elastic resistances than polymers that are linear. And so a graft polymer would be something that would be of, of a lot of interest. Uh, we've not done it, but that would be definitely a possibility. So what we will do is bring this part of the day to a close. So let's thank our speaker. <laughs>